This was a long time ago, late 90s. When I was 19, I moved from Oregon to Florida to be with my boyfriend at the time. Side note, don't ever do that. I was thinking, white sand beaches and Mickey Mouse, but instead I got swamp, bugs, and dirt roads. It was a huge shock to the system. We lived in a stinky little town called Hawthorne, just outside of Gainesville. Very small, one stoplight and four stores. Dollar General, Steve's Market, Eckerd's Pharmacy, and Sonny's Barbecue. Whoopee. Anyway, I got a job at the now-defunct Eckerd's in the middle of town. It was next to the grocery store, so everyone shopped there. After about three months or so of working there, I walked in to start my shift one day when the manager pulled me into his office. Laid out on his desk were about 30 to 40 open letters, all addressed by hand to me. Do you know this person? My manager asked. No. Read one, he tells me. So I picked the cheerful yellow one. Inside were two handwritten letters and a magazine cutout of a woman with long blonde hair, just like me. As the Ecker manager watched on, I read the letter. I skipped around a lot out of confusion, desperately trying to find out why I'm in this room. From what I read, it was mostly someone imagining what spending time with me would be like. A lot of it was sexual in nature. There were descriptions and comments about my hair, washing it, smelling it, and something about the moonlight. A few sentences were highlighted, others were underlined. My first thought was, am I getting fired? Do you know this, David Elrod? My manager asked. Hair? I said yes, I think so. The tall lanky guy with thick glasses and frizzy dark blonde hair. The regular who comes in a couple of times a week to pick up Diet Coke and medication for his mom. Late twenties and obviously social or mentally challenged. On rare occasions, he would make small talk as I rung up his soda. Once or twice he would linger at my register or stare at me, but I figured he was just trying to adjust his eyes or had poor social cues harmless compared to some other people I'd met in Florida, so I didn't pay him any mind. Until that day in Eckert's office. I knew he wrote the letters because of a strange encounter two weeks earlier. While working, he came up behind me and caressed my hair. I had to remove it from his hands and he apologized. Weird. No harm, I thought. I then went back to work. After telling my manager this, he informed me that the customer was going to be banned from the store and I was being sent home while they worked out the details. What details? I was confused. I walked out of the store and drove home. It was all so strange. Two hours later, I got home from my non-shift at work. There's a knock at my door. I look out the window and see what resembles a SWAT team. What is going on? I saw men in tactical gear with large weapons, two men dressed in suits, and several uniformed cops. In what seemed like slow motion at the time, I opened the door. A female officer holds up a few oddly familiar letters. Can we come in and talk to you about these? Realizing everyone in town has read these letters, I wanted to pass out. I don't even know the guy. We have a seat on my couch and she begins to speak. Out of the corner of my eye, I see my boyfriend shooting me dirty looks from the bedroom. The female officer mentions getting the letters from Eckert's and attempting to issue a trespassing notice. I wanted to speak to him directly, she says, because her whole department is aware of David. The officers confronted him at his residence and attempted to evoke the trespassing notice from Eckert's store. Apparently, he was not happy about this. He insisted for over 45 minutes how this was all a big mistake, and I wanted to talk to him. He was so combative and persistent, they decided to pursue stalking charges. Stalking charges? She continues. 
You need to be aware that David killed and partially dismembered his mother when he was 12 years old. He was released from a juvenile psychiatric facility less than four years ago. Diet Coke, I thought to myself. We found disturbing materials at his home, she continued. We believe he's been stalking you. My mind kept wondering. It's my mom's favorite drink, I remember him saying. David was arrested the next day for stalking, after he was found in the Eckerd's parking lot. But the last official word was, he went back to the psychiatric hospital, at least temporarily. I didn't have the chance to read the letters in full, before they were entered into some vault of evidence, nor did they explain what they found at his house, so I never had the complete picture of what was happening. My boyfriend at the time was a huge dick about the whole thing, so I moved back to Oregon a week later. Besides, who wants to hang around when Norman Bates is fixated on you? So I've been dying to share this story. When I was young, around six to nine years old, I was in the basement of my house. My older sister's room was down there, and being the youngest, I never got the remote upstairs, so I'd watch TV in her room in the basement. Well, my mom and my sisters were all upstairs. I don't remember what my dad was doing, but I remember he wasn't in the house. He was either doing yard work outside or he was at work. I was sitting on the bed and I paused the TV because I heard rustling sound. I sat up and just listened for a moment in silence. I heard a voice, a man's voice, whisper my name. I was frozen with fear and didn't dare to move for a couple of minutes. Eventually I gathered up the courage and ran upstairs to the rest of my family. What was scary about it was that it couldn't have been my siblings playing a prank. It was a man's voice. I have all sisters. My dad wasn't around and it didn't sound like him. I think about it a lot. And to this day, I have no idea who or what it was. Maybe it was my imagination or a really good prank. A ghost. I don't know. It still gives me goosebumps to this day. So I live with my dog and my roommate in a one-story duplex. I've got a fenced-off yard, and the private part where my car is parked is accessible via an alleyway with a bunch of massive signs saying, No parking, no trespassing, private property. I was sitting in my bedroom playing games, and it was around 12 to 1 a.m. And my dog, sitting on the couch in the living room, started barking at something outside. Every now and then she does this because there's a squirrel or a bush moved or something. So I get up to shush her. I open the blinds on the window to say, See, there's nothing outside. But there actually is something outside. So through the fence I can see the headlights of a car idling in front of my house. And lights start bobbing around outside. And what appears to be people walking around in front of my yard by my car with flashlights looking around, in the middle of the night. So, full disclosure, I was kind of stoned. I'm not sure if it's a reverse effect, because my sober self is an anxiety-ridden creature living under a blanket, who's too scared to send an email to my manager. But my high self is Fred from Scooby-Doo, as in, come on gang, let's solve the mystery. So I decide I'll just go out there and investigate. I let my dog out, walk my pajama-wearing, unarmed, brawless self out there, and step outside and go to the gate. I can now see it's a well-dressed woman and man in a nice, newer model car. They're walking around the front yard with flashlights. I say, Hey, this is private property. Can you please leave? The woman kind of seems startled and says, Sorry, our car broke down. The man gets in the car, she walks around, 
Gets back in the car. They talk for a while, and I'm not sure what else to do. I just kind of stand there watching for what felt like ages, but was probably only a minute or two. They seem to be deciding what to do. He starts the car back up. They pull out, proceed to drive around, pull into the public street, and park behind my neighbor's car instead. I decide to sit outside from my porch and kind of watch them to make sure they didn't get out and start investigating the neighbor's car instead. They never popped the hood of their car or got out, which seemed to run fine when they drove off. I never saw them come back. For a couple of notes, there are loads of spots you can park in and around my neighborhood that would not be clearly private property, with better lighting. And you don't need to be near other cars. But to get where my car is parked, you've got to drive down an alley and look for that spot. Like, my friends have trouble finding it. The car was a newer model sports car. I'm not saying those cars can't ever break down, but I guess I'd be less suspect if they rolled up in a Geo Metro, Mini Cooper, an old Subaru hatchback or something and were like, oh man, my shitty car broke down. When I sobered up the next day, I was like, I either just politely told some car thieves to stop attempting a robbery on me, and they did, or I made someone shitty night even shittier. I mean... They weren't dressed for car theft, more like a party or date night. The woman was in heels, and I don't know shit about cars. Maybe they really did just break down, and the spot next to my car was the closest they could find. Then I spooked them even more by taking neighborhood watch a little too far. I guess if I parked in the neighborhood, and a half-naked woman and her possibly big scary dog came outside to stare at me in the middle of the night, I'd get out of there too. I didn't report it, but I did inform the neighbors about what happened. My car was broken into a month or two later. I had some non-valuable stuff taken another night, but I slept through it and have no way of knowing if it was the same people or not. Last night, at around 5am, I was asleep. I heard a lot of the dogs in the neighborhood, including mine, barking. I tried to ignore them, because they do that sometimes. They bark for anything and everything. A couple of seconds later, I think I hear what sounds like people yelling. At least two different people. I'm still half asleep, so at first, I'm thinking it's a bunch of teenagers just being rowdy and annoying. I used to do stuff like that, but then I'm starting to understand what they're saying. It sounds more like arguing. I'm starting to wake up. I grab my phone and call the police. I'm on the phone with dispatch and hear what sounds like a woman screaming bloody murder. I've never heard anyone scream in such agony. Then I hear a man's voice say, Oh God. Oh God. Dispatch tells me that other people have called the police, so they're on their way. It sounds like people are right in my yard. My mom is awake at this point and comes to my room asking if I hear it too. We finally get the courage to look out the window. It's just one woman standing right under the streetlight near our yard and screaming. At points, she's making her voice deeper and kind of sounds like the man, but it's just her. Her hair is tangled and she's only wearing shorts and a tank top in January. The police pull up two minutes later and then try patting her down, but every time they go to pat her down, she grabs her pockets. Eventually, they just arrest her. I know she probably just wasn't all there or high, but it was scary. I've never seen someone acting like that and I've never heard someone in such agony. I don't know what was wrong with her or what happened to her after that, but I keep thinking about it. This happened to me and my mom a few months back, back in October. It happened in a very rural part of New Hampshire, like a side road on a side road type of neighborhood. It was pouring out as it had been raining for pretty much the whole day. 
My mom had just gotten back from down the street in my sister's car, and I was on the couch in the living room, when suddenly I heard the doorbell ring. Our front door has a big glass pane in the front, so we can look out from the inside, and someone can look in from the outside. Through this pane window, I see a man. I didn't get a great look at him, as I didn't have my long-distance glasses on. The man noticed that I'd seen him, and waved as if trying to be friendly. He was also wearing a poncho. I got up and thought about opening the door for Poncho Man, but relented. As I couldn't properly see who it was, I didn't want to let a stranger into the house. Instead, I went down the hall to my parents' bedroom, where my mom was getting ready for work. She asked what was up, and I explained to her that a man in a poncho was outside our door. He wanted to talk to us. She went as white as a ghost. Immediately, she stopped getting ready, closed and locked the bedroom door, and started checking the window to make sure they were locked. I asked her what was going on. My mom explained that as she was driving home, she'd seen the poncho man. He'd been standing motionless on the side of the main street. As soon as my mom turned down our road, he started to walk, presumably to follow her. She said the encounter was weird, but thought nothing more of it. Why would someone be out in the pouring rain down a back road in the afternoon? It was like he was waiting for something. I started to panic as well. My mom called my aunt and asked what she should do. My aunt told her to call the police immediately, and so we did. We proceeded to pace around the bedroom, frantically looking out the windows to see if we could see Poncho Man. From where the bedroom was angled, it was impossible to look at the front porch and see if he was still there, but we were desperate for anything. After what felt like hours, we finally saw a police car pull up. We carefully unlocked the door and went down to let the officer in. We explained what we saw, and he agreed to do a scan around the neighborhood. As he left, I noticed there was something on the doorknob. I took it off, and it was a political ad for a candidate that was running for office. It's possible Poncho Man was just campaigning for the candidate but there are a lot of holes in that story. It was pouring out, so why would you go door to door? And why would you go that route in such a rural neighborhood? The houses are so far apart, you'd barely make a dent on foot. The time doesn't make sense either. Sure, my mom and I were home, but it was about four in the afternoon. Most people would still be at work, so you'd probably get no response from knocking anyway. Eventually, the officer returned. He'd found the guy down the road and had questioned him. Pancho Man was able to ID himself and claimed that he was a political campaigner and was just knocking on doors for that reason. When probed further, conveniently enough, Pancho Man couldn't provide any other door signs as the one he had left on our house was the last one. That makes the campaign story even more absurd. Our house is in the middle of the street. It's not like we were the last by any means, so why wouldn't you bring enough for the whole street? Even the officer pointed this out to us and said that it was unusual behavior. Although the officer was suspicious of him, there wasn't anything he could do about it, as there was no way to prove intent. He told us to be alert and do not hesitate to call if Poncho Man returns. Fast forward a few weeks, and I start noticing that a police car seems to be permanently stationed down the road from us. I got curious and asked my mom about it. She said that there were multiple break-ins into the house down the road. The police were doing some sort of a sting operation. The poncho man encounter and the break-ins may be unrelated, but considering how poncho man acted, I have a sinking feeling that they are connected. Thankfully, for the past few months, we've heard and seen nothing of Poncho Man. We got a new doorbell system with a camera, and the police left the area where they were doing the sting. I hope that this whole situation is over and done with, and that I never have to meet Poncho Man.
Let's start this out by saying I've seen things. I do all the time. It's not uncommon, and most of the time I shrug it off. I have generalized anxiety disorder. I feel emotions a lot heavier than other people do, who don't have it. It can mean I cry for no reason. I get angry at nothing, and even laugh at a speck of dust. I overthink every detail throughout my day, many times. However, one big thing that goes along with this is that my mind never shuts off. I hear voices that aren't there and so on. I see figures who my brain pretends exists. So that's why I often, as I said before, shrug it off. However, this time was different. Very different. It was a few weeks ago. I was home alone. My parents were at work and I didn't have work, so I just crashed there after school. This isn't uncommon. I do it often. I'm a female and 18, so I do what any smart gal would do and lock all the doors because people are crazy. I got a call from my parents saying that they were going to be at a bar for a while. Fine by me. It meant I could read a book and enjoy the peace and quiet for longer. It was around 7 and it was dark outside. The moon gave the yard some light. I read my book for an hour and now, it being 8.25, I heard a sound from the kitchen. My head snapped over, thinking my parents had gotten home. I didn't hear either of them. But again, I was lost in my book. Hello? No one. Okay, odd. It must be my brain playing tricks. I do have a strange mind. But no, there it was again. It was a drawn out noise. I couldn't make it out. It gave me goosebumps, but again my mind plays tricks. I should just go check it out to calm my nerves. I walked into the kitchen and stopped, dead in my tracks. Two of the drawers were open. They shouldn't be. I haven't eaten yet, so I have not even walked into the kitchen. So why were the spoons and forks and knives open? Mom, are you here? It was fear. I was getting scared. I felt a panic attack coming. It just wasn't right. I like things being perfect. It helps calm me down. So when it isn't, I get iffy. I took deep breaths and closed the drawers. Could it have been me forgetting things? The wood being loose and causing them to slide out. Then I heard a knock at the door. Okay, good. Parents are home. They'll understand. They always do. I go back to the living room and go to unlock the door, but it was already unlocked. I let my hand just hover there. I locked the door. I knew I locked that door. I checked three times, peeked at it five times just to make sure it was locked. I heard a knock again. It shook me out of my slight panic. Sorry, I called to them. I opened the door. No one. There was no one out there. I looked around outside. There was no car either. I quickly closed and locked the door again, taking a step back. Okay, this isn't my strange mind. That door was locked. I knew I heard a knock. Panic. I was having a panic attack. It didn't take much to make me have one. I ran into my room and closed my door. I stayed there until my parents got home. I slept on their floor that night. Nothing else happened since I opened the door, but again, I haven't stayed home alone. I took more shifts at work and refused to be there without someone. Was it my generalized anxiety disorder? Was it my mind? Was it something else? Does anyone else have a similar experience? It's perhaps best if I provide some background and context, because it may help strengthen my story, and people will hopefully believe me. I know that a lot of people claim to have a true story about strange encounters in the woods, and I don't want people to accuse me of making this up, because honestly, 
I swear that this really did happen. It's not supernatural. It took place during the daytime, and the monster is very much human. When I was about 13 or 14 years old in 2003 to 2004, I went on a camping trip with my mother and stepfather and my four younger siblings. We're not a very well-off family. In fact, we were quite poor. I never went on holidays abroad and we would always go camping, usually to the same campsite which felt like miles away but was in reality less than 10 miles from the city where we lived. We'd been there a few times previously and knew the campsite and the surrounding area fairly well. It felt pretty safe and familiar. On this occasion, everything was going pretty normal. I hated camping. My parents would always argue when it came to putting up our tent. It was pretty boring being in the woods, and I would normally be the one entertaining my siblings. I hated not having electricity, access to proper toilets and showers, all that stuff. It could be quite fun looking back, and I do treasure the memories I have with my stepdad, who is no longer with us. Usually, we would go on long hikes or bike rides, with my stepdad using maps to charter our way to a small village, promising to get us all ice cream. On this camping trip, we were going on a 10-mile bike ride, both my parents had their own bikes, along with my sister and I. My stepdad's bike had the small trailer where my three younger siblings were sat. It was hard work going on these epic long bike rides, but I rather enjoyed being in the middle of the woods, surrounded by nature. We weren't in the middle of nowhere, but it was remote enough for it to be inaccessible to public transportation. Only forest ranger type vehicles could access the roads. During all times we went camping, we never saw another vehicle go down these roads. On this day, we're all cycling down this road when suddenly we hear the sounds of a vehicle coming up slowly behind us. My stepdad is in front of us when he stops and tells us to move aside to let the vehicle come past. There's a sense of urgency and confusion in his tone as he's unsure why there's a vehicle even here. The vehicle passes, and we were expecting to see a forest ranger vehicle, but instead, we see a station wagon type car with a long body and a large trunk, with a window at the back. In the back of this station wagon, I see several large trash bags. It's a very strange sight. I may only be a teenager, but this is a sight that set off alarm bells for several reasons. One, this is not a car that's designed for going off-road in the woods. Two, as previously mentioned, we've never encountered any vehicles down this bike road before. Three, the person driving is clearly not lost, as they didn't stop to ask for directions. Four, there are big black trash bags in the back of the car that look very suspicious. What I mean by this point, they are full and tied up very tightly. We could all see into the back of the car, and I didn't see anything poking out of the back to indicate it was full of garbage. And number five, the driver looked very rough. And I don't mean to sound rude, he looked very mean. I can't recall his features, just that he didn't look like a very friendly person that belonged in the countryside. He wore dark clothing. I think he was clean-shaven and had very short hair. I wish I remembered more about what this man looked like. As if this incident couldn't get any stranger, what took place next has left such an impression on me that I still recall the sense of fear that I felt at the time, recalling this. My palms are getting very sweaty and my heart is racing. The car drives on several more feet. The driver then stops. For what feels like the longest time in my entire life, nothing happens. We're all just watching this car. My stepdad told us to remain still. He's very serious as he's assessing the situation. Then, the car reverse lights come on, and the car starts reversing up to us. My stepdad goes into full panic mode. He tells us to run. We don't even get on our bicycles to ride. 
Instead, we all flee on foot, running with our bicycles through the woods, until we find a railway bridge which we'd previously passed over. We never look back. I have no idea if the man in the car got out to come after us. I don't know if he just continued driving. I have no idea who he was or what was in those bags. We never really spoke about what happened that day. I know that it was something that seriously scared my stepdad because of his response. And it's left me frightened about who I might encounter in the woods until this very day. A little backstory first. We had this neighbor called B. The back of his house faced the side of our house. When I was growing up, I was really good friends with his son, so I was often at their house. B was a little weird, but his wife was wonderful and his son was my best friend, so I never paid much attention to his weirdness. We lived in a small town where no one locked their doors or worried about anything. Over the winter, we'd started noticing footprints in the snow every now and then, and then leading from our back door and windows to B's house. We didn't really worry too much about it, as it was obvious he never actually entered the house. We assumed he was probably trying to get a look at my mom, who is pretty attractive. So come summertime, my dad installed a tall privacy fence on the side of the house that faced his, so we couldn't see into our backyard where my mom sunbathed all the time. And dad also installed multiple motion sensor lights. One summer day, B was wearing this absolutely awful looking light baby blue tracksuit that had shiny silver trim. I remember it clearly because my sister and I made so many jokes about it that day. That night, I'd asked my parents if I could sleep downstairs. It was probably nine at the time. All the bedrooms were upstairs, but I liked sleeping downstairs so I could stay up late and watch TV. I don't remember how late it was, but I was sitting there coloring when I thought I saw someone through the blinds at the back door. I brushed it off and kept coloring. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw that horrific baby blue and silver jumpsuit standing at our back door. I was too terrified to move, but I didn't want him to know that I saw him because the back door was unlocked. I thought that he might try to enter if he knew I had seen him. I had colored multiple pictures before he finally left. This happened more than once. I come downstairs and see him looking in the back door. He started getting bolder, and he would be looking in the door in the middle of the day. He was just creepy, but I was always too scared to tell my parents. Looking back, I have no idea why I was scared to tell them. Maybe because his son was my best friend, and I didn't want to lose that. About a month later, B was being investigated by CPS. His son was eventually taken away and sent to live with his biological mother in a different state. Not too long after that, B ended his life. I know this isn't the creepiest story, but as a nine-year-old little girl, it terrified me. My practical, in-charge self continually denied what was happening. My base instincts knew that we were prey from the moment this guy saw us. In spite of this, I'm not sure that I would have taken action if I didn't feel that my children were in jeopardy. It's pretty sad to say that I wouldn't bother an employee for just me. My husband is an executive and frequently travels out of the country. As much as I avoided going shopping at night, it was a necessity at times. Sometimes, you find out you need a poster board and glitter for a project due the next day. It happens. We have two boys who were ages 6 and 10 at the time. It was the dead of winter in the Midwest, so it was pitch blackout by 6 p.m. I went to one of the big stores that is frequently associated with strange people and deviant behavior. Mom of the Year. 
I pulled into the parking lot and was delighted to find the first spot next to Handicapped open. I felt seriously lucky until I pulled into that spot. I immediately noticed that there was a van to my left which was backed into the space. In my head, I heard the voice of my mom saying, Never park next to a van as someone can open the big sliding door, grab you and be gone in moments. Although I dismissed this as nonsense, I still took note that there was a middle-aged man sitting in the driver's seat. It concerned me enough to tell the kids not to dilly-dally when they got out of the car. I didn't want to be standing there with the door open while they looked for their shoes and toys and whatnot. I got out, and the man was less than a foot from my youngest son, and as I was getting him out of his booster seat, I could feel the man staring at us. And when I looked up to smile at him, he was looking right through us. It just fell off. We got into the store without a problem. I grabbed a cart and stuck the youngest in it. My older boy was a few paces ahead and said, Mom, I'm getting some Axe body wash and peels off to go down the aisle. Before I can stop him, I see that the guy from the van is now in front of us and is turned back and is walking towards my son. I have no idea how this happened as I looked back several times in the parking lot and I didn't see him get out of his van. The man then notices that I'm right behind my son, turns, and continues to walk ahead. I'm convinced at this point, but not scared. I continue shopping and eventually notice this guy is in every aisle as us. He's covertly looking at us. Seems to be fake shopping. He has nothing in his hands and does not have a cart. In retrospect, it took time to put all these facts together. It was as if I knew before my brain did. I decided to leave the grocery aisle to test if he would continue to follow us in the more obscure parts of the store. Magazine aisles. He's looking at a book. I'm looking at the laundry baskets and suddenly he's there examining hangers. You get the point. I headed to the checkout and was convinced that I could no longer see him, and I looked for him too. There was no way that I could safely return to the car at this point. I asked two male employees if they could walk us to the car. One said, sure, what's going on? I explained that the man had been following us, and that I knew he was parked next to us. He then said, is he bald and wearing a leather jacket? When I said that he was, the man responded that another lady had just left with her kids and said that he was following her around. Now I knew that I wasn't being hysterical, and I started sobbing. They walked us to the car, and the van was still out there. The employee walked to the back of the van and, I thought, made note of his license plate. I called a friend who worked for the local police department. As luck would have it, she was across the street at the sporting event with her daughter. She marched into the store, found the two employees, and asked them to show her the van. It was gone. The employee had not written down the license plate because the guy in question walked out with a woman. As if there aren't plenty of women who do unspeakable things themselves or help their men to do so. The police took a report and reviewed the store surveillance tape. The guy was, indeed, following us and the other woman around the store. They were not able to find him without the license plate. I trust my instincts implicitly now. Picture it. Hometown 2003. I was 25, a year out of college, working my first, grown-up job. I'd been living alone in my apartment for about six months when I arrived home to find my phone ringing. I missed the call, checked the caller ID, and I didn't recognize the number. The area code was from my old college town, about an hour away. I went about my business, but within a couple of minutes, the same number called again. Hey girl, how are you? It's been such a long time. Hi, who is this? It's Mandy. 
What are you up to? I knew four Mandys. Non lived in the town I went to college. Non called me girl all the time. Non sounded like a valley girl on uppers. Mandy who? Oh my gosh, we have so much to catch up on. So you've moved back to your hometown, that's great. Where are you working? Are you still dating that guy from high school? I so thought y'all would end up together. How are your parents? Whereabouts do you live in your hometown? What are you up to tonight? Wait, this was the fifth Mandy. Mandy Jones from high school. I mean, we'd been friends when we took dance in elementary school, but we'd long since lost touch. Why in the world would she be calling me now? This didn't feel right. Uh, hey. Yeah, so, I'm working at a local business. I, uh, what are you up to? Oh, that's great. I always knew you'd be a real somebody. So where do you live now? Are you still dating that guy from high school? That really cute one. Weird. I had only one boyfriend in high school. He attended a different school and we broke up after a couple of months. Hardly a love story for the ages. So, uh, this is Mandy who again? Girl, Mandy, come on now. So, and she continues blathering on, asking all kinds of personal questions, which I kept dodging. She kept wanting to know where I lived and what about the cute guy from school. Okay, look, I don't know who you are and I have no idea how you got this number. Mandy. Mandy Roper. Girl, I know it's been a while, but you should know that. We played volleyball together. You wrote this number in my yearbook and I just came across it. I thought we should catch up. And here are all the red flags. A few things you should know about Mandy Roper. 1. She sounds less like a chirpy valley girl and more like someone who started smoking a pack a day at age four. Number two, while we did play volleyball together, and softball and other balls, I guarantee that if you asked her, Mandy would tell you we played basketball together, mostly because, number three, basketball is the reason Mandy Roper hated my guts. I was one of the handful of freshmen on the varsity team, and within two weeks of joining the team, had made an enemy of the scariest bitch on the team. It's a very long, very silly teenage girl drama that isn't relevant to the rest of this tale. Just keep in mind that Mandy would rather have told me to go fuck myself with a rusty spork than have tea and a chat. Anyway, number four. I'd gotten the phone number when I moved into my apartment six months prior, so I couldn't have given it to her in high school. Also, I would have faked my own death before purposely giving that crazy lady my number. So, I told Mandy Roper as much. You don't sound like Mandy Roper. I couldn't have given this number in high school because I've only had it for a couple of months. And Mandy Roper hates me. She's the last person who would ever give a shit about what I'm doing right now. Who is this really? Seriously, who are you? Fuck you. Click. Over the next week, maybe two, I had several hang-ups at my office, and a rose was left on my doorstep that my then-boyfriend denied having left. I was literally clueless about stalking and harassment and whatnot, so I wasn't really sure what to do. After it seemed the hang-ups weren't going to stop, I had a friend who still lived in the town I went to college, and I asked her cop husband what to do. He took the number and looked it up for me, then called the house. The most he could figure out was that it was a little old lady who lived alone, and seemed thoroughly confused by the whole story, and swore no one else could have used her phone. My dear, dear friend Mandy must have been someone close to little old lady though, because all of it stopped after he made that call. It wasn't until years later that I realized why someone chose to pretend to be Mandy Roper. We played volleyball together one single year, and it just so happens that we were seated next to one another in the team photo in the yearbook. We were both smiling in that picture. 
we'd simply gotten used to ignoring each other by then. So, someone somewhere got their hands on an eight-year-old yearbook from someone I went to school with, looked me up, picked the person sitting beside me in the team photo, then called and harassed me for a couple of weeks. I sit here 14 years later, still unclear on who, what, when, where, why, and how. But, Mandy Roper, let's not meet. I'm currently a female in my 20s. When I was in 7th and 8th grade, I had a stalker. The first time I saw him, I was walking around the block in the summer. He drove past me in his really nice, big pickup truck. He waved at me, and having lived in a small midwestern town, I didn't really think anything of it, so I smiled and waved back. He then proceeded to circle back around the block and try to lure me into his truck, telling me, you're too pretty to be walking. I can give you a ride home. I wasted absolutely no time and sprinted three houses down inside my home. My mom asked me why I was breathing so hard and being nervous to tell her what really happened, I just told her I simply went on a jog. Now, I assume he saw me run into my house that day and in turn knew where I live now. For the whole summer when I was home alone, he would park his pickup truck in our driveway for hours, and I mean hours. He would then begin to knock on the front door and look through the window for about 10 to 20 minutes at a time, and then he would just sit in his truck after I wouldn't answer. In order to hide from him so he couldn't see me through the front window and the huge living room windows, I would always run upstairs as I would hear him pulling up. One day, my friend and I went to a middle school boys basketball tournament, at the end of the game, we were sitting outside of the school, waiting for a mom to come pick us up, as they wanted everyone out of the school in order to begin cleaning the gym. Then the truck pulls up, and this time, he asks if my friend and I need a ride home. We promptly said no, and the janitor saw all this go down. As my stalker continued to try and persuade us into getting a ride from him, the janitor opened the door and led us back into the school and he asked us if we knew that guy. We said no, of course, and that was the last of that. The same friend and I also saw him multiple times at the local grocery store, parked there as we were walking in, and he was still parked there as we left, every single time. The last time I saw him, I was in the parking lot of the local grocery store, and for some reason I never told my parents, sisters, or any of my friends about this. I'm absolutely baffled by this, and I have no idea why I pushed it so far back into my memory. I also have no idea why I never told anyone. After my dream I had about him a couple of nights ago, it's all I can think about now. So, guy in the really nice red F-150 lifted pickup truck, who also had a rat tail, let's not meet again. Not even in my dreams. Back in 2013, I just started an education, and after the first school period, I had to go out and find an internship to be able to progress. But at that time, it proved to be almost impossible to get one, so while I was looking, I decided to take another job just to make sure we had food on the table. After searching for a while, I found out a friend of my fiancé's family had his own handicapped bus company, and he needed someone to cover the night shift, since it was a bus that had to be on call at least 22 hours a day. Seeing that I'm quite the night owl, I immediately told him I'd be happy to take the job, and after I got the needed license, I was hired. The job was pretty basic pick up people and drop them off where they needed to go, and sometimes use a machine to get wheelchairs up or down some stairs. And when there were no trips, I drove to a designated area and did whatever while waiting. 
I quickly found a truck stop in the area where I could park and catch some Z's while waiting. There was a gas station where I could buy coffee in the early hours of the shift, and on the other side of the gas station's parking lot, on the opposite side of the truck stop, there was a run-down restaurant with a motel connected to it. To not disturb the sleeping truckers if I got a trip in the middle of the night, I usually parked on the restaurant side. After parking there every night for a while, I noticed one particular room had a lot of people come and go. In the beginning, I thought nothing of it, but then on one night at the end of summer, while I was half asleep with the windows slightly open, I suddenly heard yelling coming from the motel, and a guy came tumbling out of the room and started running. A few seconds later, a big guy came running after him with something in his hand. I couldn't make out what it was. I thought it was none of my business and went back to my half-sleeping waiting stage. Not much time passed and my phone went off. I had a trip an hour's drive away, so I turned on the bus and was leaving the parking lot when I saw the big guy coming round the corner. The rest of the night I had back-to-back -back trips, so I didn't park until I got home. The day after, I didn't get a return to home zone until 2 or 3 a.m. When I arrived at the parking lot, the area where I used to park had fist-sized rocks strewn all over the place. Not connecting the dots at the time, I just parked a few spots over and started waiting. I fell asleep pretty fast, but was jerked back into reality when a car right in front of my bus honked its horn, flashed the high beams, and revved its engine. I thought it was some idiot who noticed me sleeping and found it funny trying to make me shit myself, so I jumped out of the bus about to tell him to piss off, but instead of driving off or stopping, the driver made the start brake thing with the car, indicating that I was the one who should go. And then I connected the dots. Not wanting to seem like a pushover, I stood still and stared at the car. Not that I could actually see anything with the high beams almost blinding me. And after what seemed like a really long time, but must not have been more than 30 seconds, the car drove off. After that, I decided to park near the trucks from then on. A month or so passed and nothing had happened since the car episode. I figured that nothing more would happen if I just kept parking by the trucks. Then one night, I had a long 12-hour shift on a Sunday, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. I didn't have time to eat dinner before work that day, and during the first half of my shift, I had back-to-back -back trips with no time to eat. So when I got a return to home zone, I parked in the far end of the almost empty truck stop and got ready to eat my now very late dinner that my fiancé packed for me. I wanted to watch some TV on my phone while eating, so I sat with my back against the driver's side door and got comfy. While turning my back to the door, I'd accidentally hit the door lock with my elbow, but that was my luck. As I was sitting there scrolling Netflix on my phone, I suddenly felt the bus rock and heard the clack of the door handle behind me smack back in position. I quickly turned and saw a dude with a hood over his head, quickly crouching and proceeding to lay on the ground and crawling under the bus with a big-ass kitchen knife in his right hand. I quickly got up and made sure the other two doors were locked, and then I looked in all directions to see if I could spot him. He was still under the bus, and I was sure as hell not jumping out this time since the knife made his intentions pretty clear. I turned on the engine, turned on the spots on the back of the bus, and looked around to see if it had scared him off. And luckily for me, it did. I saw him run off and into a bushy wooded area at the end of the truck stop. I never parked at that truck stop again after that night, and I made sure all the doors were locked every time I was parked. So about 12 years ago, I was 9 years old. I was home alone with my 12-year-old brother. We were supposed to go to my aunt's house to have lunch and wait for my mother there. We got up at 10.30 a.m. I took a shower, then my brother did. After that, we were both in the bathroom brushing our teeth and finishing up when we heard someone knock on our door. 
Since every time someone knocked at our door, they turned out to be a salesman or Jehovah's Witness, we kind of waited for them to go away. After a couple of minutes, I went to see if they were still outside through the window, and no one was there. What a relief. We continued getting ready when we saw a shadow go by through the bathroom window, which was kind of like a small square of frosted glass. We waited and watched just in case it was a bird flying by, when a hand hit it, clear as day. We got scared. We didn't know what to do. My brother had his cell phone, so we immediately called the police. While it was ringing, we heard a loud bang at the door. Someone was brute forcing it. I don't know if they were kicking or ramming it, but it was one of the most frightening things I've ever heard. My brother told me to lock the bathroom door, so I did. It took five bangs before the perpetrator finally bashed the door open. The police answered. I remember the exact thing my brother said. He was whispering. His voice could be barely heard. Hello, there's someone in our house, and I think they're stealing. Then a pause. We're at 1249 Maple Street. Another pause. I'm with my little brother locked in our bathroom. Please hurry. While all that, I was sitting against the wall, hugging my knees. It was one of the most nerve-wracking experiences ever. I could hear the man going through all of our stuff. Emptying stands, going up and down the stairs, opening cabinets. He even broke a few cups and plates. Then I heard the sound my cell phone does when it turns off, and I remembered leaving it on the kitchen table. I felt so stupid for leaving it there. Things continued for a couple of minutes when we heard him trying to open the door to the bathroom. My brother got a hold of a big metal rod we had lying around there. The man started kicking the door. Who's there? The man screamed. We said nothing. Another kick. Then another. I felt I was about to have an anxiety attack. My chest started to ache. I had chills and was really hot. I tried to remain calm, but it was just too much. After that, he stopped. We heard the door opening, and then silence. We waited for almost ten minutes before going out of the bathroom. The living room was a total mess. Lots of papers and books on the floor. The cabinets were open cups and plates on the floor. In our mother's bedroom, the nightstand and the closet were open. Everything inside them was all over the place. Upstairs in our room, it was the same thing. In about five minutes, the man was able to go through everything we had and left a total mess. After that, my brother called my mom and she ordered us to go to my aunt's ASAP, so we did. When we got there, I was a little more relaxed. My aunt was waiting with us with ice cream, probably because my mom had told her everything, and she wanted to calm us down a bit. We got back home at about 5 o'clock. My mom told her boss she had a home emergency, so she left early. She tidied up the house, cleaned up, and left everything the way it was before so we could be relaxed. I really appreciate her effort and my aunt's to calm us down and do everything, so we didn't have to think about it. According to my mom, the police got to our house after she arrived, at about three, four hours after the incident. She explained everything, but because of a lack of evidence, nothing could be done. The man was never caught, and honestly, I don't think they even tried to search for him. The next few days, my mom was home with us. Now I tell the story is a funny anecdote. Luckily, no one was hurt and he only took useless stuff, but at the time, I was really scared. To a nine-year-old, an experience like that can have serious repercussions. I'm lucky it never came to that, and I got over that after a couple of weeks. So yeah, that is my story. The story I'm relaying happened when I was about 8 years old. I should mention that I'm a girl, and I was a really tiny thing as a child, always at the bottom of the growth curve, so people thought I was younger than I was. Growing up, 
My parents worked a lot, but my grandmother lived with us, so my sister and I were used to being alone at home at a young age, even though my grandma was usually lurking somewhere. One summer, our air conditioning went out. It was a really hot summer, so my parents called their usual company and asked someone to come fix it ASAP. They assured my parents that someone would be out the next day. Three days passed. No one came, and the company kept promising someone would come the next day. My parents stopped believing them, so they called a different company who came the same day and fixed it. Four days after my parents had initially called the first company, I was sitting at home when a knock came at the door. I answered the door, and there was a man with a uniform on, with the name of the initial HVAC company we'd contacted. He said he was there to do work on the air conditioner. I explained that my parents had gotten another company to do the work because they'd waited so long with no response from his company. His face immediately changed into one of extreme anger. He said, So you had me drive all the way out here for nothing? You think it's okay to treat people like that? I was stunned. Again, I was still a pretty little kid, and no one had ever spoken to me like that. I just sort of stammered out something like, if he had questions, to call my parents, and I shut the door. My heart was beating so fast and I was scared. I didn't tell anyone, because it didn't occur to me that his response was highly inappropriate. I felt like I, or more likely my parents, had done something wrong, and after the way he spoke to me, I felt ashamed for some reason. That weekend, my mom and I were at the grocery store. She was at the checkout and remembered something she needed and asked me to run and get it. As I was walking down the aisles toward the item in question, I froze. Standing in the aisle was the HVAC guy. I didn't know if he'd seen me, and even if he had, wasn't sure if he'd recognize me. So I kept walking towards him. As I stopped to reach for the shelf, I was standing next to him. He turned his head towards me, narrowed his eyes, and said, Fuck you, bitch, in the most evil, frightening tone. I just stared at him. I didn't know what to do, so I grabbed the item I needed and mumbled, Sorry, and ran back to my mom. As we were loading the groceries in her car, he drove right past us with his window open, staring at me the entire time. She didn't notice. I didn't tell my parents that story until I was well into adulthood. I think I worried as a kid that if I told, he would get into trouble and come after me or my family. Even now, decades later, no one has ever spoken to me with those words or that sheer evil hatred in their eyes. So, angry HVAC guy, let's not meet again. If something that trivial led you to that kind of fury and cursing directed at a young child, I can only imagine how you handled bigger aggravations in your life. My childhood best friend, Marie, and I were around 11 and 12 years old at the time. Marie's family had their own campsite in a provincial park about two hours from our hometown. We would spend the entire summer each year living in the camper out there. This particular summer, I was able to go and stay with them for a week. We were excited to spend our time adventuring around the forest. On the last night I was there, we decided we wanted to hurry down to the ice cream shop by the lake before it closed. It was early evening at this point. Still pretty bright out, but beginning to lose light. The path we took was down a short slope right next to the main road, with maybe ten feet of thick brush and trees in between. On the other side was the forest, with more tall, thick brush. So we were walking along, not seeing another person on the path in front or behind us. We hear a sudden rustling and snapping of branches, similar to the sound of maybe a deer moving through the woods. I wouldn't have thought anything of it, but then the sound of running footsteps follows. Marie glances back 
and suddenly grabs my arm, urging me under her breath not to look back. At the same time, the running stops. I don't know why I didn't ignore her and get a look myself. I guess I could sense the very real fear in her voice and chose to listen. We both start to panic, getting that feeling like when you're running up the stairs after turning the basement light off. We pick up speed as much as we can without breaking into a sprint, knowing that the ice cream shop is only about a minute walk away at this point. The path soon breaks and we're in the parking lot. Suddenly Marie steers me hard to the left, heading towards the lake in the boat rental instead of continuing straight to the ice cream shop. I go along with it silently, understanding ice cream is no longer an interest right now. Marie is clearly panicking at this point. We're both looking around, but it seems whatever scared her is nowhere in sight at this point. Marie walks up to the boat rental and gets us a kayak. We climb in and begin to paddle out into the middle of the lake. As we paddle, she tells me that there was a man behind us, and that the man had stopped running at us very abruptly upon making eye contact with her. He'd been wearing a long black coat with a hood up despite it being the middle of July. He had a terrible smirk on his face, and she swore that as he stopped running, she saw him put something shiny away in his coat. He appeared to have just emerged out of the bushes after we walked past, given the sounds we heard right before he came running onto the path. We reached the center of the lake and stopped paddling. I pull out my Nokia brick phone that my parents had given me, thank God, just in case. I hand it to Marie and tell her to call her parents to come pick us up. As the phone rings, I see her look out past me to the shore, and she goes pale, lifting a hand to point out to what she's seeing. I turn, and there was a man stalking his way around the path that circled the edge of the lake, staring out at us. We sat in the middle of the lake and watched him do two full laps, never looking away from us, before finally disappearing. It took us a few times to get a hold of her family. We were freaking out the whole time as the sun got lower and lower. We did manage to have someone come with the truck, but by the time we reached the shore, it was pretty dark out. I don't know what we would have done if we hadn't been able to call for a ride. Looking back, I don't know why we just didn't go up to the ice cream shop, inform an adult there, and ask her parents to come get us then. But it worked. We got back safe, and we thankfully never saw the man again. In 2012, I was living in Rome for the summer. My apartment was very close to the Colosseum, but I was working as an undergraduate visiting researcher at the university. Each day, I would walk to and from work, which took about 35 to 40 minutes. One evening, I decided to take an alternate route that would shave off some time from my walk. Normally, I would have had to gone through the main termini where all the people in shops are. This new route, however, had me cross the tracks farther down from the actual station. As I got closer to the tracks, I noticed the area began to look really rough, and that there were a lot of homeless people hanging around. I power walked through it, and just avoided eye contact with everyone, and eventually reached a small traffic tunnel. About halfway through, I felt someone come up behind me. He smelled terrible and was almost certainly foreign as his Italian had a very, very thick accent. My Italian also wasn't very good at that point, and I couldn't really understand what he was saying. So I said in Italian, Sorry, I don't speak Italian. The guy still wouldn't stop talking to me, even though he knew I couldn't understand what he was saying. I just assumed he really wanted money or something, 
but would go on his way when he figured out I wasn't going to give him any. We reached the end of the tunnel, and I was doing my best just to ignore him. I looked around and noticed the streets were abandoned, even though it was just after rush hour. I turned around to him at some point and said in Italian, Stop. But he just kept following me and talking. I'd begun to get nervous, but because he wasn't doing anything really threatening, I wasn't overly worried. When I reached a small stoplight, though, the guy's hand reached down and tugged at the bottom of my dress, and he sort of started to lift it. At this point, I felt threatened and swung my bag at him, which made him stagger a bit. It was enough for me to take off in a bit of a sprint. However, I noticed when I looked back, the guy was still following me, just now at a bit more of a distance. I kept jogging until I finally reached a small grocery store and I ran inside. The guy was right at my heels. At this point, he was directly behind my back. So close, in fact, I could feel his body heat. He then started reaching for my elbow like he was going to drag me out of the store. I shoved him off again and ran up to the two girls who were by the produce and seemed to be around my age, asking if they spoke English. When one of them said yes, I motioned to the guy behind me and told him that the man had been following me since the train tracks. The girls' faces turned pretty serious at that point, and they started speaking rapidly to the guy in Italian. They then turned back to me and asked whether I knew him. They told me he was saying he was my boyfriend, and that we had just been in a fight and I was lying. I told him that I'd never met him before, and I had no idea who he was. I'd say the fact that he couldn't speak English and that my Italian was limited to telling people I couldn't speak it, and also asking for the bathroom, made them certain there was no chance the guy actually knew me. One of the girls then left to get the manager, who promptly threw the man out and told him he was watching on the monitors to make sure he went away. After the manager realized the man wouldn't go away, and having to attempt to re-enter the store about half an hour later, he called the police. The police arrived and I told them my story. By that point, the guy seemed to have finally left. The manager then gave me a ride back to my apartment so that the guy couldn't follow me just in case he was still lurking around. Luckily, that was the end of that and I never walked past the train tracks again. I think I got lucky to have found the store but it still taught me a very valuable lesson about being careful about the areas you venture into in new cities. Now I ask the locals for areas to avoid instead of wandering around foreign cities on my own. I recently acquired a new roommate the entire situation should never have happened, but I needed someone to help with rent, so a Craigslist posting later, he moved in. His name was Greg, and he discloses to me that he did have some strange sleeping behaviors. Funny thing was, I also had a history of sleepwalking, but only on rare occasions. The first incident occurred about one week later, when I heard him screaming in the middle of the night. Since we both slept in different rooms on different sides of the house, the screaming sounded distant, but enough to scare me, so I ran to check on him. As I get closer to his bedroom, he stopped screaming, so I just went back to bed. For the next month, he had no issues. I noticed he had no friends or family that would visit, and I never saw or heard him on the phone or texting. Then another random night, Greg started screaming. Same thing. I got up and started to go to his room, but he'd stop. Then one night, I was awoken by screaming in my bedroom. I couldn't see anything in the panic, so I turned on the bedside lamp, and there he was, at the foot of my bed, wearing some sleeping clothes. He scared me, so I started screaming and woke him up. He apologized and went back to bed. And the scariest thing happened. About two nights later, I awoke to clanking. It sounded like tools and hammers tapping. 
I turned on the light to see Greg kneeling down in a corner working on something with his hands. A few seconds after turning the light on, Greg froze, then slowly turned his upper body around and stared blankly at me while I laid in bed. I was beyond creeped out, so I slowly slid out of bed and out of the house. After sleeping in my truck down the road in an empty church parking lot, I returned to the house at 8 in the morning. Greg was gone. All of his belongings were gone. No signs of him anywhere. It was like he never lived there. I didn't know any of his friends or family, so I had no one to call about him. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months. When I moved out after the lease was up, I was moving furniture out of my bedroom. In the corner of my room, where I last saw Greg kneeling down, I realized the floor vent for the air conditioning was loose. Inside the floor vent was an envelope with a ton of pictures of me sleeping. The pictures had handwritten dates and times written on the back of them. The only other item was a whittled down wooden broom handle brought to a point. I truly believe Greg was preparing to kill me that night, and he realized it. Because it was a sleepwalking Greg that was going to do it, he left to save my life. It appears Greg had been coming into my room almost nightly and working on making the broom handle a stabbing weapon, and I never heard until the last night I saw him. This happened six years ago on the last day of August. I had just come back from spending the summer at my home and was gearing up for another year of school. My girlfriend and I drove back from the airport and were coming into the student complex where we lived. Standing outside, smoking, is this man, Toby. Neither of us liked Toby very much. He'd been living in the downstairs apartment last year and he'd been really creepy to one of our floor mates, Sarah. So creepy that he'd been banned from the upper floors, so we mostly ignored him. Toby, however, never lets a chance to socialize pass him by, so he says hello and tells us that we can't get inside. This is because the doorknob is missing. Weird, but the building was only renovated into a student complex the year before, and it was kind of trashy so we didn't think anything of it. I put the doorknob back on as Toby wanders down the end of the walkway to yell obscenities down the street. That's a little worrying because even though Toby is kind of creepy, he's not violent or overly aggressive. We slip inside, think that he must be drunk, and settle in to go to bed since my plane got in late and it's around midnight at that point. Sleep, it turns out, was impossible. Toby, in a rage outside, is yelling and carrying on. He comes in and out of the house, banging doors and stomping around. Now most people moved out at the end of the year, and we're not even sure if Toby lives here anymore. We decide it's fine. He'll tire himself out and he's not hurting anyone. Just ignore it. About an hour and a half later, Toby is still at it, but now he's outside our window. We're on the side of the building that's next to another building, and next door they're turning it into more student complexes. Toby is banging on the chain-like fence, swearing about his house, which is right outside our window. At this point, both my girlfriend and I are concerned for our safety. The yelling and banging are incredibly violent, and show absolutely no signs of abating. So we go out, lock the doors, and phone the police. The police take a while to arrive, but Toby is disturbing the peace so they have to talk with him, tell him to quiet down and go to bed. They come and talk with my girlfriend who called them and they leave, telling us to call back if things keep up or get worse. This is the end of it, we think. For around 15 minutes anyways, everything is dead quiet. Then Toby discovers we've locked the doors. He is not happy about that. The yells of obscenities laced with, this is my house, my house, getting louder and louder. He goes back to beating up the chain link fence and yelling down the street at drunks coming out from bars. 
but mostly he's outside our window. Then there's a brief silence, followed by the sound of shattered glass. Toby threw a rock and broke one of the windows in the room next to ours. Had he been one window over, it would have gone straight into our room. We called the police again, now very scared for our personal safety. Luckily for us, however, Toby stopped throwing rocks at windows after that, possibly because the windows are about a story off the ground. The yelling and banging at the chain link fence and at the front and back doors didn't stop though, not until the police came around and took him away. We saw him a few days later, after we learned that he in fact did not live in the apartment anymore. He was sitting on the grass by the driveway on the phone. He gave us the worst look when we got out of the car. Luckily, I haven't seen him since, and I'll be happy if I never run into Toby again. Close to 10 years ago, my best mate and I scored the deal of the century. Liv and her parents recently purchased and refurbished home for cheapest chips rent, so the property wasn't considered unoccupied, and their insurance still covers it. They were planning on selling their house in the country and moving closer to town in a year. But when they spotted this place, it was perfect, so they snapped it up. They couldn't be bothered with dealing with random tenants for a year, so we were offered it. It was a lovely old mid-Victorian style house with a hallway running the majority of the length on the side and three bedrooms and a bathroom coming off that hallway to the right. At the back of the house was an open plan living room and kitchen and a backyard. It was in an inner Melbournean suburb so it was totally fenced in with six foot fences on three sides and the front had a cutesy white picket fence. On the right side of the property, an outdoor gravel pathway was wedged beside the bedroom walls and the fence line. It began with a gate in the front yard and ran the length of the property to the backyard. This is important for later. My mate obviously scored the master bedroom at the front, with lovely vertically opening bay windows facing the front garden and street. I had the next bedroom, with a window facing the gravel path and fence and our third bedroom was our study. We lived here close to 10 months in bliss. Great house, great company, and even though the area was considered a little dicey, the location was stellar. One hot summer night, we said our goodnights. I hit the hay and zonked out immediately. My housemate stayed up in bed to read for a bit, with just her bedside light on. She was doing that for just over an hour, before she heard a weird scratching sound on the front window of her bedroom. Initially, she put it down to an overhanging tree branch until she realized there was no overhanging tree branch. She sat, frozen in fear, blankly staring at her book for what felt like eternity, till she heard the noise again and again. Slowly looking up, she saw a guy wearing a hoodie trying to open her window looking her dead in the eyes. She screamed, jumped out of bed, and ran straight into my room. I woke up really dazed as she was pulling my hand and whisper yelling that someone was trying to break in. She had a tendency to be a little overdramatic sometimes, but I swear I've never seen someone look so genuinely terrified. I went to grab my phone to call the cops, but just went completely still when we heard the distinct crunching of someone walking down the side path of the house. We both rolled off my bed onto the floor and went completely still. The crunching continued, getting closer to my bedroom window. I don't know what it is about distinct sounds at night when it's otherwise quiet, but it sounded deafening. And then I realized why it was so loud. My window was wide open. I jumped up, slid the window down, and slammed the lock shut just as he reached the window. He looked at me, but he didn't react at all. He just calmly tried to open the window, but when he realized he couldn't, he continued down the pathway to the backyard. 
I was thoroughly shitting myself now, and my housemate was on the floor, sobbing, looking up at me like a bunny about to be torn apart by a fox. I sprinted to the back door to thankfully find it locked, and I ran back to my room and called the police. I don't know what the cops knew that we didn't, but they must have broken a land speed record to arrive all of three minutes later, lights and sirens off. We saw them go down the path, guns drawn, straight to the backyard. There were some noises from the yard, then a knock at the back door a moment later, and the police identified themselves. Turns out the guy had vaulted the back fence, and another patrol car was headed to the next street over to look for him. The two cops at our place asked if we were okay, then they asked if they could come in and look around. The cops were honestly amazing. They managed to calm us down while making sure the place was safe. I was really impressed with how they handled the situation. I offered them a cup of tea, which they politely declined as they took our statements, and they asked if there was anyone we could stay with that night. My housemate and I stayed at her boyfriend's place for a few nights after that, and when we stayed in that house, it was never the same. We felt completely violated and ended up moving out a few weeks later. We never found out if the guy was caught, but there was a random stabbing a few nights after the incident at the train station two streets over. If it was related or not, I don't know, but all I can think is that we were so lucky that it went the way it did. When I was 18, I lived in a detached garage apartment that had a second apartment upstairs. My apartment was an efficiency and only had walls without doors to separate the rooms. The second floor was being renovated and no one rented it. At night, I would hear footsteps and it sounded like it came from upstairs. I could hear someone going up and down the stairs outside at night. One time I put my St. Bernard outside to use the bathroom and I went outside when I heard scratching on the steps to find her wrapped around the stairs in a way she couldn't have done by herself. I started having friends stay over because I thought I was imagining things since it was my first time living alone. One night I was laying in bed and heard a noise that woke me. I looked up, half awake, and saw a shadowy figure at the foot of my bed. I could see the outline of what looked like a thin man or woman with shaggy hair and a top hat. I told myself I was just being paranoid and imagining things. I grabbed a hold of my dog and covered us with a blanket, telling myself it wasn't real. A few weeks later, my car had a baseball thrown through the window. I was out taping up my window and my neighbor came up to talk to me. A young couple rented the house on the same lot. I asked her if she knew if our landlord had either been working on the upstairs unit or maybe rented it out because I kept hearing noises. She told me no and offered to have her husband go take a look upstairs in the unit. While he was inspecting, she started telling me to be aware of a homeless man who was seen in the alley behind us. I asked her to describe him, and she tells me that he's tall and thin and has dirty long hair, and he's always wearing a funny hat, kinda like the Mad Hatter. Her husband comes back and tells me that the door was unlocked, but that the floor isn't done in the upstairs apartment and there's no possible way someone could be up there because there was no place to step. I called my mom and she helped me move. While I was loading the U-Haul, I found three house keys in random places in my yard. All of them went to my door. I'm pretty sure this guy was living with me and I had no idea. This story happened to me and my girlfriend. To give you some context, she and I met online in 2015 and fell in love. We communicated via Skype for three years because we lived in separate countries until I came to live with her in February of 2018. So, 
A few weeks or so before I flew to meet her, she'd made friends with a group of guys in her hometown. I got to meet them shortly after living with her. They ranged in age from 16 to 18. They would come over to visit us very often because we lived close to the high school they attended. At first, I found it a bit weird that they would always come over and take up so much of our time, but they turned out to be really good friends over time. But back then, there was one in particular that always bugged me. Dan. As I mentioned earlier, the guys would come and visit and hang out with us a lot, but Dan was the one who would always take up most of our time. I say this in the sense that he would message us almost every day, asking if we were home and if he could come over, and he would proceed to spend almost the entire day, from morning to night at our place. He would also go out of his way to meet us and bump into us wherever we went, whether it was the store, a coffee shop, or any other place you could think of. While I found this annoying, there wasn't anything particularly creepy or weird going on, yet. Mind you, we live in a small town where it's almost impossible to not run into someone you know on the way to the grocery store or something like that. Plus, I'd only known him for about as long as my fiancé had known him, which wasn't a very long time. I thought I was maybe judging him too harshly. Also, he was in a long-distance relationship with a girl from another country, whom he was hoping to meet in real life, just like me. So I could at least relate to him in that aspect. I decided to let it slide, but made a note to keep an eye out for any suspicious behavior. The problem seemed to start once he also started trying to incorporate himself into other aspects of our life. He would make friends with anyone we'd been friends with for a long time, tag along with us whenever we were going to meet up with said friends, even though he hadn't been invited, hang out with them without us knowing, and that kind of thing. My favorite instance, and the one that made me become more suspicious with him, was one time when we were going to hang out with some longtime friends of my fiance. As the friend had finished her shift and we were getting ready to get into her car to drive over to her place, Dan suddenly shows up and joins us to their place uninvited. It was so off-putting that he would just invite himself over without our friends or even our permission. Then when we were done there and walking home, the three of us passed his house and assumed he'd go home. But no, he kept tagging along with us with the excuse that he needed to buy something at the store, which was bullshit since all the stores had been closed for over an hour, and he knew it. So he kept walking with us until at one point, when we were almost home, we put our foot down and told him we were tired and we wanted to go to sleep as soon as we got home and told him to go to his. It took us ten minutes to convince him during which he would react to our requests with awkward and creepy silences until he finally headed home, annoyed. My fiancé, concerned that she'd offended him, asked if he wanted to hang out with us later in the week. What followed was various weeks of him coming over to our place, staying until late at night, and him slowly leaving more and more of his stuff at our place just so he could have an excuse to come over. I shit you not, he once brought over his PlayStation with a bag of 30 or so games, which stayed there for three months. It got to the point where people thought he'd moved in with us. He also seemed to have problems with all of our friends. Among other things, he would get into arguments with our friends and told one friend who was goofing around at our place once that he'd kill him if he didn't shut up. He lied to us and made us believe two good friends of ours wanted to report us to the police for drugging our friends. He allegedly hit one of our friend's girlfriends once and other stuff like that. It was like he wanted us all to himself and to isolate us from our friends. The last thing he did, which ended up being the key to us getting rid of him forever, was that he started dating my fiancé's cousin, Mary. He broke up with his long-distance girlfriend under suspicious circumstances and started dating Mary. As a result, whenever Mary came to visit, Dan would come along as well. My fiancé wanted to hang out with Mary, 
there was Dan. Even when he was dating someone else, his obsession with us never ended. One day when we were in town, we met another friend of ours, and Dan insisted that we hang out with that guy all day when we'd already agreed to do something else. When we refused, he and Mary ditched us to be with him, and that was when we'd had enough. We got into a huge fight later that day in a park with some of our friends as witnesses and told him off, telling him we wanted nothing to do with him anymore and to pack up his stuff and never to show his face at our place again. This unfortunately resulted in my fiancé and Mary not talking to each other for a long time. We had to move a few times since then, and we never saw him and blocked him on all our social media and pretty much blocked him out of our lives. We know from friends that he tried a few times to ask around where we live, but our friends always have our backs and didn't tell him. Mary and my fiancé recently made up after she dumped him, and now that the sour taste he left behind is for the most part gone, it goes without saying that we never want to see him again. This happened in Boston in 2013. I was looking for an apartment with a roommate. We had a pretty tight budget, so rather than using a realtor, we replied to ads on Craigslist. It wasn't my first time using Craigslist for this, and having come across my fair share of creeps, I made it a point to never go to tours alone, and to make sure someone who wasn't coming with me knew the address of where I was touring. So we schedule an appointment to meet with someone to view a one-bedroom that was open in a three-bedroom house in Dorchester. We get there, get inside the front door, and he told us to wait in the foyer. I like to think I have pretty good intuition, and the place immediately felt very creepy. He said that the open bedroom is in the guest house in the backyard, but it looked more like a garage. Then he said that his neighbor has been asking to move into the open room, and he doesn't want her to know that he's letting other people tour it. So when we go to the backyard to see the guest room, we should try to walk as quickly as possible so she doesn't notice in the event she was looking outside. All the red flags are going off. Then he told us he'd go back there first and tell us when it was okay to head over. He leaves. A minute or two go by, and through a window, we can see a few other guys that we didn't see before head to the garage. More red flags. Me and my roommate look at each other, and without even having to say a word, immediately leave the foyer and walk to our car. We get in the car, lock the doors, and drive away as quickly as we can. About five minutes later, he calls us and asks why we left. He sounded really upset, told us we wasted his time, blah blah blah. I know in my gut that he didn't have good intentions, and to this day, I wonder what would have happened if we went to tour the garage. So, I live in supported housing. This means that I basically have a room in a house that I share with others who have learning disabilities. When my best friend moved in, this one particular tenant, who we soon started to call Creeper, full-on stalked her. He would look outside her room late at night, waiting for her to come out. If she didn't come out, he would go outside and knock on her window. He would watch her come out of the shared bathroom from the top of the stairs. He's tried to kiss her and one time touched her on the shoulder and said he was looking after her when a support worker asked what he was doing. He's also waited on the stairs when her and I came back from a trip out at like half past 11 at night. Needless to say, we waited round the side of the building until he went away. He's also watched her through his blinds and he's been warned at least three times by support workers to leave her alone. 
Now, here's the worst part. He's 45, she's 22, and he has a girlfriend who he's been with for 10 years, but he doesn't like her very much, judging by the frustrated phone calls he has with her on the daily. Now, he's also displayed a milder form of this behavior when I moved in, but he started leaving me alone within a few months. But the difference with my friend is he is infatuated with her. So not only is he emotionally and physically trying to cheat on his girlfriend, who he doesn't even seem to like, but he's been doing it since my friend moved in, which was at the beginning of the year. He needs to be charged with sexual harassment and his girlfriend needs to dump him. He needs to be thrown out of the house too, but... His special needs seem to give people an excuse to not have to punish him, and I'm sick of it. If it weren't for whatever he has, he'd be in prison. I wanted to share this because I'm done with him. I want him to leave my friend alone. I want him out of the house. The staff aren't doing anything about it. I want to take matters into my own hands, but I'm not sure what I can do. I just started my freshman year of college. I'm going to a college out of my home state, and no one I know is going to the same university as me, which means I'm rooming with a total stranger. Normal, right? That's what I thought. When I met my roommate, she seemed nice enough, and her parents were nice too. Everything was going fine for the first couple of weeks, but then DJ's odd habits began emerging. I noticed that every time I would sit down at my desk, she would move from wherever she was sitting to come sit on the floor behind me. Every time. The first few times I thought it was just coincidental, because it happened when she would just be entering the room from her last classes. I thought maybe she just wanted to relax by sitting on the floor. Weird, yes, but plausible. But no, then the other scenarios began happening. She has a beanbag sat right by, so close that it's touching, and this is her favorite spot. She always sits there to do homework and whatnot. If I decide I want to sit at my desk, she will actually move from the beanbag to the floor behind me. Sometimes she doesn't even do anything. She just sits there. She abandons her homework to sit behind me. I don't sit at my desk too often anymore for this reason. DJ has a job that she has to get to by 8am every weekday, which means I typically get woken up early, which is fine. I usually just roll over and try to get some extra sleep. A few times now though, I've woken up to DJ staring at me. One time she was a foot away from my bed, just staring. She also makes a point to look at me when she leaves, but it doesn't end there. I'm utterly disgusted by hair, right? It actually makes me sick to my stomach to see hair all over the floor. Well, DJ has long, curly red hair, which is fine. Only she sheds so much and I've seen her sit there and pull out her hair. Okay, whatever. But one day I decided I wanted to wash my sheets. I don't even sleep with my sheets. I either sleep with only a throw blanket or only my comforter. I never, ever go under my sheets but I lay on top of them so they still deserve to be washed. When I pulled back the sheet, I was met with strings of DJ's curly, long hair. I about threw up. I have no clue how it got there. I'm not sure I want to know. It gets better. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, DJ and I share the same last class together. When class ends, she sits there and waits for me to pack up my notebooks and things. And then we walk back to our dorm room together. Only here's what's strange. She never tries to talk to me. She just walks two feet behind me. By itself, that seems kind of normal. But with everything else, it just sort of feels like she's watching me. Perhaps not the most creepy story out there, but it's definitely a little unnerving to me.
When I was about 20, I moved out of home into a house share with about five other flatmates. During my 10 month stay there, I probably had about 25 different flatmates due to the high turnover. Some were travelers backpacking around Australia and would only stay a few weeks before moving on. I had a good friend in there around the same age as me, Jenny, who moved in shortly after I did. We were always joking about the many colorful characters that we encountered during our stay. Jenny and I both had the largest rooms in the house that were near the front, and in between our rooms was a tiny space us flatmates used to call the broom closet. It was big enough for a bunk bed, but that was about all. Whoever stayed in there would store their stuff under the bunk. One day, shortly after the broom closet, had become vacant again, a Brazilian guy named Marcel, who I think was about 38 years old, rocked up and moved in. He seemed fun enough at first. He was always stoned and in a good mood, and always sharing cones with everyone. He always had this big bong with him and would laugh and say, <laughs> we smoke bongi, yeah? Our house was always a bit of a party house, with drinking and smoking being pretty common here. Over the next several weeks, Marcel's attitude changed from this happy-go-lucky guy to increasingly paranoid and angry. I remember him breaking down crying one night, and he kept saying, The children are dying. The children are dying. And I didn't know how to help him. Another time he lashed out at all of us and said the house was full of unashamed homosexuals and women having free sex. I remember coming home one time and he was in his room with the door open, but I didn't want to look in, so I hurried to my room. But on the way, I heard him making these strange grunting noises. It sounded almost animalistic. Eventually his erratic behavior and mood swings got to the point where the rest of us flatmates spoke to the landlords and they came over and asked him to leave. He packed up his stuff and as he was leaving, he pointed to us and said, God would judge us all one day. After he'd gone, Jenny and I went to check out the broom closet as we'd never seen it empty. I noticed next to the bunk, near where the person would lay their head to sleep, there was a small hole in the wall. It was just big enough that when you put your eye near it, you could see Jenny's entire room and it overlooked her bed. Next to the hole was a faint but grubby looking man's handprint. There were also stains further down the wall, toward the other end of the bed. Jenny was horrified to realize Marcel had been watching her in her bedroom all this time, and he appeared to have been doing stuff on the other side of the wall. I was disgusted as well. It was truly disturbing. We were pretty much sure he created the hole himself, as before he moved in, a young girl stayed in that room and she never mentioned it. We both moved out shortly after that, but during our time in that house, I'd say that was definitely the creepiest encounter we had while living there. This happened five years ago when I was 19. I was studying in a college town and sharing an apartment with Emma. Emma was a year older than me, and even though we didn't know each other before becoming flatmates, we quickly became friends. One day she told me she had to go to the art school where she was studying to bring home some pieces she needed to work on. She told me she could use an extra pair of hands, so I met with her. The school's located on a small square in a pedestrian zone. We went, grabbed what she needed, and left. We were heading out of the square and towards our apartment, distracted by the conversation, when Emma taps on my shoulder. I look at her, and she points to our right. There's a man there. He's recording you, she says. I turn my head, and there he is. A man in his forties with a phone pointed at us. He wasn't even trying to hide it. I immediately started walking in his direction, and Emma follows me close behind. I know you were recording or taking pictures of us, 
I want you to delete it right now, I said to him. He started laughing and pretending not to speak my language. Okay, no worries. I'll repeat it in English for you. Delete the damn video. He laughed again and told me he wasn't doing anything wrong. I was having none of it. My blood was boiling at this point, and with the rush of adrenaline, I snatched the phone out of his hand. I opened the gallery, and of course, there I was. The video mostly zoomed in on my chest area. I delete it, and before me appears what seems to be a similar video of another woman. Before I have time, he reacts and snatches the phone. He looks at me with a grin on his face and says, Don't worry, I have more women on there. I was shaken up, about to burst into tears, and I decided to turn around and walk home with my friend. In hindsight, I know this could have ended badly for me. He could have gotten violent when I took his phone. But part of me regrets not smashing it on the ground when I had the chance. This was back in 2012, but it still gives me the heebie-jeebies when I think about it. I had just gotten out of a bad relationship and was living with my grandparents, hunting for an apartment. I found a house that was only a few blocks away from the group home I work at. I thought, great, even in snowy weather I'd be able to walk to work. I called the number on the Craigslist ad and set a time to check it out. I boogie on over and I'm greeted by a man in his mid-thirties. He seemed very awkward at first, but showed me around, and said if things worked out, I could take my pick of either of the available rooms. He started making small talk, and was becoming increasingly weird. He was asking me questions about how old I was, if I smoked pot, if I was single. Not totally red flags, but the way he came off was weird. Nonetheless, I say I have to go and he gives me the email of the homeowners. Turns out it was his girlfriend's parents place. So I dawdle on home and email the couple giving my references and income info, as one does. A couple of days later, the husband calls me and says hastily that the rooms are no longer available. I am a bit miffed, but what can I do about it, right? Cut to a week later, my friend and I are hanging out smoking pot and just shooting the shit. I can't remember how it came about, but she mentioned that there's a website where you can see all the registered sex offenders. Of course curiosity takes over and we look it up. I think you know where this is going. We scroll and scroll and eventually apartment man. My jaw drops and I can't believe what I'm seeing is charge, underage incest. I don't know if anything would have happened, but I'm glad the homeowners turned me down. And what dumb luck that I stumbled across the website a week later. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening, and thank you to my channel members and patrons. Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, 
Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cubex, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.